Hello. Uh, okay. When I was little, I went to the Rose Gardens with my mom. I don't remember whose idea it was, but we were going there to draw the flowers. If you've ever gotten a card from my mom, you know that she is something of an artist. And I, being eight years old, could not match her skills. I threw a tantrum and decided that I was not cut out for drawing or creativity in general. This quickly became a part of my identity. When everyone was drawing and painting and doodling during their free time, I read a book instead because I was not a creative person. Um, when my friends were taking art in high school, I was in study hall because I was not a creative person. When everyone in my creative arts class in college made their beautiful final projects, I wrote an essay because I'm just not a creative person. You read a lot in college. I got through the mountains of pages by reading the first couple and completing my assignments from there. <laughs> Maybe I should have written this about something else. Um, I've gotten used to this system. By my sophomore year in one of my psychology classes, we had to choose 300 pages worth of books to read and complete our final paper. We had to read them and apply something we learned to our lives and reflect on that for 10 pages. We could choose books from a 10 page list or anything as long as we ran it by our professor. I didn't put too much thought into it. I chose the books based on what was available in the library. One of the books that I happened to choose was The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown. The subtitle on the cover reads, let go of who you think you're supposed to be and embrace who you are, your guide to a wholehearted life. I began to read through it a week or so before the paper was due, as per usual. This was well into my time of virtual learning in the spring of 2020, so I did most of it from my room. I highlighted and took notes because I had to, but outside of that, I didn't really think too hard about the content or implications of the reading. Three quarters or so of the way through the book, I began a chapter titled, Cultivating Creativity, Letting Go of Comparison. Brown refers to comparison as the stifling combination of fitting in and being better than. It is impossible to have both, yet so often I find myself in this impossible circle, striving for two mutually exclusive things. The part from this chapter that really grabbed my attention was in her summary at the end. She wrote, I'm not, a very, I'm not very creative doesn't work. There's no such thing as creative people and non-creative people. There are only people who use their creativity and people who don't. Unused creativity doesn't just disappear, it lives within us until it's expressed, neglected to death, or suffocated by resentment and fear. This made me stop and think. Since I was a kid, I've been living my life using creativity as little as possible. Most of the time, I tried something creative, a reaction similar to that of when I was eight years old in the park happened, except a more grown-up version. I didn't cry or pout or lash out, but I would get very frustrated with myself for not being capable in this area. I do not like feeling incapable. It was easier to use the I'm not creative phrase and just never put myself in that vulnerable place and try. This was the first time I had stopped to consider an alternative. For the semester leading up to this event, I had been looking at this girl's art online and I thought it was really beautiful, but every time I thought maybe I could try that, an iron wall came down. Of course I couldn't do that. I would look like a child or a fool if I tried. I would be disappointed with myself. I'm not a creative person. However, with this chapter in mind and the requirements of my assignment, I decided to give it a go. I had a journal that I had to use for another class in the semester before, so I got it out and set to work. A couple of hours later, I had a finished piece of art and no feelings of disgust, disappointment, or frustration. In fact, I even felt a little proud of what I had produced. I was shocked. This was an entirely new combination of feelings. Still a little wary, I tried the next day, the same reaction. I tried again and again and again, sure that the feelings of frustration would come eventually, but they didn't. Some of you might be thinking, great, she likes to draw now, that's good for her, what's the point? That's okay, that's what I was thinking while I was writing this too. <laughs> the point is that sometimes we are the ones getting in our own way most of all. Personally, I feel this is more often the case than not when it comes to myself. 
For most of my life, I deprived myself of any form of creative expression because I was afraid I wasn't good enough or worthy to participate. I took away something that has now become one of the biggest parts of my life. I was talking to Josh the other day and he mentioned how it was really weird for him to see me maturing and becoming an actual thinking adult when he still remembers me running around as a little kid. I think this was a big part of my growing up over the last couple of years. Allowing myself to be artistically creative led to me journaling and journaling about everything. It's helped me process and understand myself better than I ever have. Through it, I've learned more about God and learned about how to express and understand my beliefs about him. When Josh was saying this, I couldn't help but think where I would be mentally, spiritually, maturity-wise if I had not allowed myself to be creative that one time. So the point, I guess, is to stop confining yourself in the non-creative box or the untalented drawer or especially the I can't. There is so much to learn about yourself and God in those places that you don't want to go. Thank you. There are a lot of pages here, and I tried to cut it out even. So we'll see how this goes. I appreciate uh, what you had to say, Emma. Um, I always love hearing others talk, and I don't like hearing myself, ironically. Uh, that actually might surprise some of you. Um, words are something that I actually dread because uh, growing up, uh, even this last year, I actually studied uh, portions of the Old Testament uh, on your words and the seriousness of them. And all throughout the entire Old Testament, it kept um, just glaring at me how serious what we say and how serious what God says actually is. Uh, it impacts us and it impacts others in uh, so many profound ways. And one of the reasons why it impacts me so much is the fact that growing up, I was a strong-willed child who had high convictions at the same time. And usually those combinations don't go together. Usually a strong-willed child is kind of a rebellious child, and mine played out in high convictions. And so I always wanted to do what was right, uh, even at the cost of uh, whatever that cost was at the time. My parents had a book on the wall in their um, office shelf library uh, called Raising the Strong-Willed Child. And I had three other brothers, and deep down inside, even though my parents didn't say it, I knew that they had that book for me. <laughs> Growing up, uh, even in my senior year of high school, uh, in U.S. history class, we learned about a song uh, that we were going to sing in choir, and it seemed heretical to me after I learned about it. So naturally, I did what any senior would do, and I chose not to sing the song. You can imagine this, can't you? Have you ever been to a concert where someone in the middle of the choir didn't open their mouth the entire song? Usually that person threw up or they passed out, one of the two. Neither was going to be the case for me, though. And I wanted to be mature about it, so I went to my teacher ahead of time to share my concerns. They had said that they were a Christian. Uh, I wanted to give them a chance to convince me otherwise to change the song or to provide a way for me to get out. And their response was actually not the one that I needed. The response was, well, you're an artist. And so you can make the song mean whatever you want it to mean. Needless to say, they had no idea who they were dealing with that a wishy-washy, compromising answer would not sit well with me. In fact, their comments to dock my grade and hurt my chances at going to college would actually just spur me on to feel like this was definitely the thing I had to do. And so on the performance day, under the stage lights, when the music began to play, I stood still the whole way through the song. His veins began to boil, his eyebrows furrowed and his tiny little mustache twitched to the side and his eyes just locked in on me. As a high school senior, as a teenager, despite the wilting feeling inside of me, I didn't shrink on stage. I stood there straight through the entire song, respectfully trying not to draw attention to myself, yet fulfilling my convictions alone. 
Moments like these make me look back on my life and realize there are actually a lot of moments like these where others could probably look at the situation and say, why are you so annoying? Or why are you so inspirational? One of the two, and it usually was a combination of both. Sometimes it seemed inspirational, sometimes it seemed annoying. And to myself, sometimes it was a combination of these also asking, why am I doing this alone? Why aren't people speaking up when they think that they should? Why do I stand here doing this, putting myself through this? Why can't others come to my side? All of us have areas of our lives, just like Emma announced, that we have tendencies to be, in some ways, extreme. Extreme quiet or extreme talking. Mine was the opposite. Mine was extreme talking. Mine was um, saying things probably in ways that I shouldn't have said or wish that I would have done differently. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 18 says this. It says, it warns us that the righteous and wise avoid all extremes. Solomon also said other wise things. He also made note to the fact that with many words, sin is not absent. And for me, I oftentimes would fill in the blanks. When the silence was there and I thought something needed to be said, I would be the one to say it. This continued even when I was a pastor. One of my very first years as a senior pastor at a small church, I was introduced to a new Christian who had been attending the, uh, the church for over a year. They had ironically become a Christian at the church, but yet was now living with a woman who was not his wife, and he was still married. And no one bothered to tell him that it was wrong. He had no clue whatsoever. And so the leaders were hoping that I would confront him when I came and also disciple him at the same time. And perhaps they needed discipling uh, since they had this point of view. But why hadn't this been done sooner or why did it have to be me? And deep down inside, even though I did say things that, uh, and did confront things and did try and fill in the spots, I often probably felt the exact same way that you feel in certain moments. Feel like you're unprepared for the moment, all alone in the moment, uh, maybe not trained for the moment, yet feel like you need to do it anyway. And in some of these moments, I wondered to myself, I wish that maybe a quieter soul, maybe a gentler spirit could rise up in my place. Oftentimes, I had a wake of destruction possibly behind me, not intentionally, but simply out of folly and ignorance. The Bible also says that folly and ignorance are destructive forces, even with good intentions. And in part of my life, as I look back uh, as a strong-willed child who wants to do what's right, high conviction sometimes also brought high guilt. I would sometimes apologize to my brothers or others for things uh, I really probably didn't even need to apologize for. In fact, on Christmas one year, my brother, as an adult and as a joke, uh, gave me a t-shirt. He had made t-shirts not only for me, but for all my brothers. Uh, and the t-shirt was a phrase, I'm sorry for being mean to you all my life. Please forgive me. I'm glad you're my brother. It was a joke because this is what I said to them on a regular basis growing up. Sorry for being mean to you today. I'm glad you're my brother. I felt guilty for some of the things I said, maybe slightly rude, maybe unkind. Maybe I felt like it was needed to be said in the moment, but maybe the gentleness was not there. Maybe I was not slow to speech. Uh, maybe it was not helpful. And so at night, my routine was I wanted a clean conscience before bed, so I would apologize for my sins. And my brothers would laugh about it nowadays. And to a certain degree, it was good, it was helpful, it was right to be able to speak when you need to speak. And perhaps your uh, tendency is the opposite of this. Maybe your tendency is not to speak when you should, because you also feel inadequate or unprepared or don't feel like you have the right thing to say but maybe your tone would be slightly gentler than others. Maybe you are the one that everyone is hoping for, but people like me maybe jump in a little too soon. Over the last year, God has been kind of refining me in this process even more, uh, trying to have me pull back more 
Look for opportunities to be able to allow others a chance to speak before me. Be slower in what I have to say. Make sure that what I'm saying is actually helpful. And do exactly what uh, Ecclesiastes 5 says, not be rash with your mouth or hasty in your heart to utter things before God or even men. And I think that's appropriate around this time. I wanted to kind of end my reflection by uh, just giving an encouragement. Around this time, uh, around uh, 400 AD, there was a tiny monk who was naturally quiet. His name was Telemachus. Telemachus came from Asia and was a monk in a monastery and came all the way to Rome. This was 75 years after Nicaea. He was an obscure little Christian from the east, and he had come, uh, according to tradition, to celebrate Christmas time. And he came to uh, Rome to an amphitheater because of all the noise and all the people that were there. There were over 80,000 people probably packed into this tiny little amphitheater. And many leaders uh, had tried to abolish these games in in the past, but what was happening during that time was the gladiator games. It's ironic to think that during uh, years after uh, Christ, 400 years after Christ, gladiator games were still uh, taking place even though uh, Rome was considered a Christian nation at that point. These were the same games that murdered Christians. And as they entered into these gladiator games, the gladiators would actually train their entire lives Uh, to be able to participate in these. They would get their bodies in perfect shape and they would come in and they would salute uh, the leader of the the emperor, the leader of the festivities at the time and say, we who are about to die salute you. And they went and uh, died entertaining the crowds. Well, this little monk had heard about all of this and he went in and when he went in and saw all that was taking place, he was horrified. He was horrified to the point that as different things were happening and people were dying, he jumped over the rails and ran down into the sand and spoke up. He said, in the name of Christ, stop. In the name of Christ, stop. And as the story goes, one of the soldiers uh, looked at him as he was standing in between uh, him and another gladiator and ran him through. Others stoned him. And with his dying breath, He said the last words, in the name of Christ, please stop. His blood fell on the floor. He was considered a martyr from that point on. And his little tiny impact, his small little voice that he was probably not prepared to say, ended the gladiator games for the rest of history. As I look at this, I remember this story because it was told to me by another quiet soul when I was 12 years old at a church camp, and that was the very first time that I dedicated my life to Christ and his ministry. And I remember thinking about all that and thinking there have been countless people throughout my life who have had great impact on me. They were quieter souls, and I appreciated them. You may have been one of those. Um, and I'm sorry. I think my hope for myself as I go into this next year, and my hope for you also, is that our gentleness would be evident to all. That we would be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry. Not so that we won't speak, but that we will speak wisely and rightly. My hope is that we will have gentler spirits to speak up, to have impact on those perhaps more profound than what we realize, and that will build others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. And as we do, I pray that we will rid ourselves from bitter rage, brawling, slander, among every form of malice there is, because we clothe ourselves with kindness, compassion that forgives one another just as Christ forgave us. Thank you.
Okay, so um, I'm not a public speaker, so I'm either going to look down the entire time, I will not look at any of you, or I'll look up and then spend five minutes trying to find my place. So bear with me. Uh, something I have always struggled with in life is contentment. Uh, no matter how well things are going, I will always have something to complain about, and most of the time it is something totally not worth complaining about. Um, when minor inconveniences come my way, like an unexpected trip to the store, a change in weekend plans, or even Ellie not napping as long as I had expected, it is so much easier for me to gripe and grumble and dwell on how annoying it is instead of taking it in stride and being thankful that I even have money to go to the store, have friends to make plans with. Um, I lost my place. Look at this. Or <laughs> Ellie even taking a nap in the first place. Uh, the Bible stresses numerous times the importance of contentment in any circumstance. Hebrews 13, 5 commands, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake, forsake you. Now, this passage is talking specifically about money, but it still applies to life in general. The Lord is faithful and will never abandon us and break his promise to us, which is astounding to me. Even when I'm whining about the many things I have been blessed with, he still loves me and died for my sins. Now, I'm not meaning to say that we should be content and happy with tragedy and death. In fact, nowhere in the Bible does it say to be content with such terrible things. When Lazarus died, Jesus did not say, it's okay because I have to be content with everything so I can't grieve. Instead, he wept in anger and brought Lazarus back to life because death is nothing to be content about. What I am talking about today is being content with daily life. Instead of whining about the many frustrations in our lives, we should choose to praise God for the many blessings he has given us and, in my case, ask him for patience and perseverance to move past the obstacles. More often than not, I fail. Uh, when I decide to do a chore, I decide it must be done right then. Sometimes it works. However, if Ellie is awake, I can count on that chore not getting done. For example, when I try to do the dishes when Ellie is awake, which I have learned is a terrible idea, she decides she must be held. She then proceeds to climb my leg and make plenty of noise to make sure that I know that she's there and is very displeased um, that I'm doing the dishes instead of holding her. Now she's a baby. She has baby needs. Babies deserve to be held. They are, in fact, more important than dishes. But in my checklist brain, this was not on the list, so I find myself getting frustrated at her. Can't she see? I am trying to wash my mountain of dishes. To avoid these frustrations and interruptions, I have decided that when Ellie is awake, I will not attempt to get the chores done. If that means an ever-growing heap of dishes, so be it. After all, my child's need for love and attention are far more important than a clean counter. Now, I'm not saying that I always manage to have a good attitude about Ellie's interruptions, but however, oh, that was a lot of words. It is easier to be content with the interruptions when I choose to focus on contentment over a to-do list. While putting my attention away from annoyances, I have been able to make some progress in my journey of contentment. For example, I love decorating our Christmas tree. It's a really big deal to me. I wasn't sure how it would go this year with a crawling baby. And if you know Austin, decorating is not something he really jumps at the opportunity of doing. So I was thrilled when he said he would decorate with me. I had the lights up on the tree already, so all we had to do was put up the ornaments while listening to Christmas music, hot chocolate in our hands, laughing in slow motion as if we were in a Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> as you can see, my expectations were oddly specific, very high, weird. In actuality, what happened was Austin watched Ellie to make sure she didn't try to eat a tree or eat an outlet cover, while I put the breakable ornaments on the tree. <laughs> He, he then proceeded to take the plastic ball ornaments and throw them at the tree <laughs> while grinning and chuckling. <laughs> In my mind, I thought, you know what? I am going to be angry about this. However, luckily, the smart part of my brain was like, hold up. 
This is actually kind of fun, and dare I say it, cute and spontaneous. <laughs> You are not going to ruin this day. This is going to be a happy memory of decorating the tree together instead of a cringy memory of me getting frustrated at Austin for helping me with the ornaments while also trying to watch a baby. Right then, I made a conscious decision to focus on the good and to be grateful for being blessed with a hilarious, fun husband. I think um, as fallen human beings in general, it's far easier to be discontent with our lives, but what miserable lives those would be. I'm, well, I'm challenging myself not only to be content with my life, but to focus on being grateful. 1 Colossians 3, 16 through 17 commands, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God for the, f giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We are commanded to praise God and do everything with gratitude in our hearts, giving thanks to Him continually. It is really hard to praise God with gratitude when we are griping about our lives. So I challenge everyone and my sp myself specifically to try to make conscious decisions to instead of being ungrateful. Praise God and give thanks to him and be content with the minor inconveniences that come our way. The end. I want to start my personal reflection uh, with a warning. I'm not a good reader, and I don't claim to be a good speaker. So if I stutter, mumble, and shake, please try to ignore it. If I confuse you at any point, it's because I'm confused myself. <laughs> <laughs> I ask if I faint, please help my wife get me to my car. <laughs> I'm nervous. I don't know why, but I guess it's because of you guys I'm nervous. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I, first start, I first attended this church, uh, which was the Church of the Lamb, back in uh, 2001. At that time, I had been searching for a church I could call my own. A co-worker of mine, Pat Mangus, invited me and my family to come visit. I accepted the invitation, and we went. Mike Spencer was the pastor then, and Sean Myers was the assistant pastor. And I was so impressed by how the service went that I uh, decided to come back the next week. I heard Denny Lobb teach that next Sunday, and uh, I made up my mind, this is going to be our church. We had been Pentecostals for too long. This was the church I was looking for, a church that taught sound doctrine, not a lot of singing and feeling good about yourself, a lot of crying, speaking in tongues, binding Satan, and being slain in the spirit. That by saying the sinner's prayer, you were saved. And the more I attended this church, the more I learned. I was even impressed by the selection of praise songs and hymns. From the leaders, I learned the importance of the lyrics when singing hymns and praises. It's not about me, it's about him. Something very new to me. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank God, first of all, and thank him for all of you and my church family. And because of this church, I have a better understanding uh, on how to read and how not to read the Bible. I have learned the reliability and historicity of the Bible and how many people were willing to sacrifice their lives for the books we now have. The apostles' important role in it, that the Bible is self-authenticating, that it is God's inspired and infallible word. And how do we know? Well, Jesus said so. Christ testified that the Bible is from God. Jesus had an extremely high view of scripture. He is the truth. God's stamp of approval through his, through his death and resurrection. 
God incarnate. I used to say, what would Jesus do? Now it's, who did Jesus believe he was? I had been taught that the Holy Spirit would tell me what a verse or passage was telling me and what it meant to me. They were wrong, I was wrong. I realize now that what I was taught is a very dangerous practice. I know now that the Bible is God's special revelation to us. That's how God speaks to us, not by inner feelings, signs, or a still small voice like I have been taught for years. Prayer is not taught in scripture that it is a two-way conversation. Now, Sean Meyer said this to me one day about the Bible. He said, uh, if it is new, it isn't true. If, and if it is true, it isn't new. And I thought to myself, this guy is really smart. <laughs> he is. And because of this church, I've learned the principles of hermeneutics. Also, the difference between uh, in narratives and didactic, didactic scriptures. I heard Pastor Wendell say it this way, the descriptive parts of scripture and the prescriptive parts of scripture. When Ted Rapone said something about the Bible that stuck with me also, he said, the Bible does not necessarily endorse what it accurately reports. Wow, this guy is good. <laughs> I have to remember that. For, for most of my life, I had a false belief in uh, who God was. Because of this church, I know now that God is a spirit, neither male nor female, that God is a triune God, that, he is, that God is sovereign, that he is transcendent. I have learned of his attributes, omnipotent omissions, omnipresence, that he is immutable, that he is the highest standard we measure all things to. Because of this church, I've made sense of the whole of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Different heretical views of the Trinity, modalism, tritheism, Arianism. One of the most important lessons I've learned here is the difference between subjective and objective truths. That is good stuff. Sometimes I feel out of place here, but thank God for his love for us. I've learned the difference between the essential doctrines of Christianity and disputable matters. Because of this church, I've learned new words and their meanings. Well, not that I can pronounce them correctly, but <laughs> words like antinomianism, Gnosticism, Platonism, and Patripassionism. A lot of isms and a lot of ologies here. <laughs> I have a better understanding of how to pray and who to pray to. My prayers have changed from give me this and give me that to include Lord, please come soon. How some Christians are Arminians and some are Calvinists. From this church I've learned that the Bible does not teach that God guides us through inter internal promptings. That there is no support in scripture for the idea of hearing from God to live our best as Christians and that everything we do in this life when done with thanksgiving is an act of worship to God. What scripture says being led by the spirit really means is up to us to make best judgments when we make decisions about anything. Pastor Wendell, in one of his sermons, I got a better understanding of our calling to be Christians. Pastor Wendell and Greg Kokel said the same thing about being called to ministry. One of the most misunderstood aspects of decision making for Christians, that somehow we got the idea that God distributes ministry in the church by calling. And this is why you have some people saying, I feel called to do this, or I was called to that, or I was called to preach or to start this mission. Pastor Wendell said it well when he said, the need itself is the call. You don't need to be called to be an elder. You need to be chosen by the leadership based on your qualifications. How about this? Go out into all the world and make disciples. 
Do we need permission from God to do anything meaningful and useful in the body of Christ? The New Testament does not teach God distributes ministry in the body of Christ through calling. And if it does not teach that God distributes ministry through calling, then why are we waiting for a calling in order of what to do in ministry? Or why are we declaring ourselves having been called to this or that? And like many of us, I used to confuse God's gifts with God's calling. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 reads, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now from this church, I have a better understanding of judging. We are to make judgments, but not hypocritically. Or do you not know that we, or, you do, or do you not know that Lord, the Lord's people will judge the world? Don't you know we will judge angels? I thank God for this church and for accepting me back as they repented, brother in the Lord. Thank God for the leaders and elders, for the leaders, elders, and teachers. And I want to thank God for the men and women who get up here and rightly do divide the word of God, who study diligently to show themselves approved by God and help equip me to defend my faith. There are so many people I would like to thank for their service here, and I will attempt to name them. If you have given a sermon here and I have forgotten to mention your name, please forgive me. I would like to thank all the guest speakers who have shared here with us also. Thank you, Pastor Wendell, Denny Lobb, Dave Stevens, Tom Detmer, Ted Rapone, John Nelson, Eric and Carrie Warren, Greg and Andrea Weaver, Nate Elkington, Guy Platter, Steve Long, Lon Deal, John Schutz, Nate Herbert, Joel Gregory, and Tim St. Peters. Thank God for the young leaders and teachers of this church also. These young leaders and teachers are the, are the future of our church. I believe they are very well versed, very intelligent, and a blessing to me and to my church family. Even though they are much younger than I am, I, I am still learning a thing or two from them. Josh Miles and Josh Birch, thank you. Thanks, Harvey. Is he not the calmest, nervous person you've ever seen? <laughs> pretty good. So when we, when we, uh, when we contemplate the, the concept of edification, at least as we see it in Scripture in the New Testament, we, what you'll find pretty quickly is that it's not really ever a solo act. Right? Edification is, a, is always applied or typically is applied in a, in a corporate sense. And so it's from Scripture that we get this idea of, of mutual edification. And where we, where we as, as members of the body can come alongside each other and can encourage each other, support each other in this race that we're in. We can encourage each other in our, um, in our, in our efforts towards Christ-likeness. And I was just thinking about that a little bit as I listened to the four people who came up here to share and thinking how about, about how much I appreciate times like this as opportunities for that mutual edification. Not just to where we get to hear some, some fresh new voices up here or get to, to hear from people we don't normally hear from, uh, not, that we, not just that we are encouraged and edified by them, but also that, that after the fact, after the service, there's a chance and opportunity for us to then 
affirm them and encourage them and edify them. So I would challenge you guys um, to take to heart the, the things that we've learned today. Appreciate the opportunity we've had to learn more about our brothers and sisters in here uh, and approach these guys after the service and, and share with them and, and walk alongside them. Can we do that? Okay. Would you all stand with me? And I'll just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be of courage, be strong, and do everything in love. So let's go out and remember that uh, those we interact with, the people that we speak with and deal with in our day today, we are either bringing glory to Christ's name or slandering it. So God be with you.